Welcome to the Wenatchee School District public hearing on proposal for sale of surplus property. The public hearing regarding the Wenatchee School District proposal for sale of surplus property is now open. The purpose of this public hearing is for the Board of Directors to hear and consider testimony or comments regarding the district's proposal to sell 0.57 acres of unimproved land located at the corner of South Wenatchee Avenue and Terminal Avenue, adjacent to Mission View Elementary Campus, which was declared surplus by the Board on May, 29, May, May, on May 9, 2023. At this point, I would like to pass it over to Superintendent Bill Eagle for his presentation. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, as Board President Inigas indicated, this is a hearing regarding the county's proposed acquisition of one of our surplus properties near the Mission View campus. And I will share some background information regarding the the property that we surplused uh, that is in question and the county's appraisal of that property. And then my recommendation uh, for moving forward with this. So in 2020, the county did approach the district uh, about accessing the property that you see here in the arrow, it's adjacent to Mission View to conduct studies for use of that property as a potential stormwater collection area. Um, that permission uh, to access and do a due diligence study was granted and the county has done their due diligence and deemed that the site is a feasible location for stormwater collection. They are interested in the purchase of the property for that purchase, or excuse me, for that purpose. And uh, because we surplused the property in May, the county went forward with an assessment of the value of that property. Um, this is another look at the actual area that we're talking about. Um, on May 9th, uh, Resolution 0323 was uh, declared by the board, uh, which made this portion of the Mission View campus area uh, a surplus property and since that time the county has worked with a third party for an appraisal of the property the appraised value from the county is 125,000 so we're here this afternoon to allow for public comment and discussion of the county's proposed acquisition of the property for their use in stormwater control and this hearing will provide an opportunity to hear public comments and testimony or discussion either for or against the sale of the property to the county and i do have uh, recommendations on that uh, it's my recommendation that the board consider moving forward with the potential sale agreement to the county uh, for this property in question and i'm further recommending that a, a, at a future regular meeting the board provide authorization for the superintendent to enter into negotiations with the county uh, on this property. And I, I, an example of some items I feel need to be negotiated, the county's proposal includes a statutory warranty deed, and the district may want to seek this as a quick claims agreement instead. Uh, I could work or Dr. Kalahar could work with our legal counsel and the county on uh, moving from a statutory warranty deed to a quick claims deed. The county is aware that uh, we may want to move in that direction. Um, I am sure that that would uh, uh, that change would would need to go before the county board. Uh, I do think they meet in July so we could have a conversation uh, and get that moving forward in, in July and maybe be ready for August contingent upon approval of the sale agreement by our legal counsel. Thank you, Bill. At this point, do we have any requests for comments? Okay. Hearing that there is no speakers, do we have any questions from the board? Hearing no questions and no comments or further testimony, 
I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Thank you, Julie. Okay. Seconded. We have a motion. Um, we have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? I motion one passes. board member remote. Oh. Just to make sure you got that vote. Catherine. You gotta you have to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Perfect. The motion passes. The motion carries. The public hearing is now closed. Thank you to everyone who who attended. <laughs> the board is scheduled to take action on the proposal for the sale of the surplus property at its regular meeting, which will begin at six. Thank you.
Good evening. I welcome everyone to the June 27th regular board meeting. We'll begin the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. At this time, I'm going to request to amend the current um, agenda to add the oath of office for Dr. Corey Kalahar before the adjournment. Do I have a motion? So moved. Seconded. Thank you. My apologies. Um, we do have Catherine Thomas attending remotely. So there's a motion on the floor to add um, to the consent to the to the regular board meeting agenda uh, to add the oath of office for Dr. Kalahar. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. All opposed? Motion carries. So there's no discussion. Next, we have the consent agenda. In this consent agenda, we have the minutes from the June 13th regular meeting, vouchers from payroll, the personnel report, the surplus report, and the contract. Do I hear a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move to consent the, to, <laughs> to uh, uh, approve the consent agenda as presented. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> I second. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. We have a motion and a second. All in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. Aye. Aye, aye and no discussion. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any opposed? Motion carries. Next, we have citizen comments. Anyone wishing to make a citizen comment can still sign up at the entry of the door. Um, our attendees uh, viewing us remotely had the opportunity to sign up in advance. And I believe we do have a public comment today. All right. Karen, you will have three minutes for your comment. Thank you. I'm Karen Norlin Crater, and I'd like to um, thank Wenatchee School Board members uh, for the action they took a year ago to work with the ESD and to select Bill Eagle as their superintendent for this last year. Um, I really personally want to thank you for doing that. As you can see, it's been a, a good choice, a wise choice. And I'd like to also thank Bill Eagle for caring enough about Wenatchee School District to take that year from his profession. And uh, I know why he did it. He cares enough about Wenatchee School District. So thank you for that. Thank you, Karen. Okay, no further public comments. We're gonna move on to our special presentations. Thank you, we are Excited to have a couple of folks from the county here today to talk about the Malaga Mercado. I'd like to introduce uh, Commissioner Kevin Overbay and Ron Crittlebaugh, who is an Economic Services Director, uh, to give us an update on the Mercado and answer questions the board may have. So welcome, gentlemen. I think it's on there. So thank you so much for having us here tonight. Uh, Ron and I are excited to uh, answer any questions you may have on the Mercado. I'll just kind of give you a little bit of a historical perspective. Uh, we started actually this endeavor in uh, September of 2019. Hard to believe that was almost four years ago. And uh, this was actually, uh, it was started as an idea uh, just a little bit before then, actually with the um, inception of the Trust for Public Lands Agreement that uh, Parque Padrinos worked on, the city of Wenatchee and Medhall Park in the revamp of Medhall Park. And some maybe opportunity for uh, Latino owned businesses uh, to be able to actually uh, utilize that park, you know, as kind of a uh, incubator type space. There was some uh, hiccups with that uh, as we went along through that process. The county actually supported that endeavor. And uh, so as a part of the uh, uh, business specialist, uh, Stacey Lukensmeyer, as part of Wenatchee Valley College, part of the uh, Center for Entrepreneurship Program, uh, she actually uh, put together a field trip. Uh, with uh, Parque Padrino's uh, members, uh, members from the college, uh, some uh, uh, government entity representatives. I had the uh, pleasure of being able to go on that trip to Pasco and actually see the marketplace in Pasco. 
And uh, I was really amazed. Uh, some of you may know Teresa Zabeda. Uh, she actually grabbed me by the arm and says, you're going with me, Commissioner. And she was my escort through the market the entire day. And uh, at the end of the market, uh, after going through that, we were there enjoying uh, some of the cuisine that was actually offered at the market. And we started talking about, is there a place in uh, Chelan County that this might be able to be done? And one of the first thoughts that came to me was a parcel of property that's actually owned by the school district for future school use in the Malaga area. It, uh, it has great access and, and uh, off of the highway, has about 28 acres in, in size, uh, is actually, uh, is, is currently zoned to Rural Village. And so we uh, came back from that meeting, uh, had an opportunity. Uh, the uh, superintendent at that time was Paul Gordon. And uh, so in October of uh, 2019, uh, we met with Paul Gordon and uh, John DeYoung. And at that time, the uh, CFO was uh, Larry uh, Mayfield. And I had a meeting with them and said, hey, you know, we would like to look at this. And what does this look like maybe for the school district where we might be able to not only provide entrepreneurial opportunities, you know, for the uh, Hispanic and Latino populations, you know, this marketplace, which is culturally significant, but also be able to uh, provide an educational opportunity for students and uh, for ASB clubs uh, to be able to be uh, have a fundraising opportunity and uh, other business opportunities that may come along with that. And so as we talked through that, we actually started talking about uh, what would the design look like. Um, we also wanted to make sure that if we were to make an investment in this particular piece of property in the school district, school board was willing to provide that opportunity, that uh, there would be some infrastructure improvements that not only would be beneficial to the market while it was there, but also be beneficial maybe for future siting of the school in that location. And so with that, we actually worked uh, with uh, the um, school district uh, on this particular piece. And uh, TCF Architecture is actually one of the firms that the school district utilizes for, you know, its uh, school um, designs. And so we had an opportunity to actually work with them and uh, provided the some funding uh, to actually do a feasibility study and receive that from them that basically said, yeah, it would be feasible to put this marketplace on that site and actually located uh, areas within that. And so what we'll do is I'm going to turn the uh, turn the uh, slides over to Ron and we can kind of see about uh, showing you a little bit about this. I don't know if you're familiar where the location of the property is at, but uh, this is kind of a great overview of Chelan County. And uh, you can see the Malaga area there. The Mercado is kind of pointed out uh, in, uh, in white. And then what we'll do is we'll go ahead and come in. So that section of property right there in the middle is actually the, the parcel that we're speaking of. It's actually made up of multiple parcels. Uh, along uh, Saturday Avenue and Dixie Lane. Uh, there is a house located on the corner of that uh, parcel. You can go back one slide. There's a house actually located on that corner that I uh, know was actually slated potentially for uh, demolition by the school district. And we asked, you know, while we were in the, the talks about the potentially leasing the property from the school district, if they could leave that with the idea that we would actually use that not only for administrative uh, space to uh, manage the marketplace, but also to uh, install a community kitchen for use by the community uh, members to actually offset some of the needs that they would have to be able to produce products for the, uh, for the marketplace itself. Um, and so the result of the feasibility study is in the next slide. And it basically shows a stormwater septic uh, kitchen, the Mercado location, and then parking. And the idea was that the school would potentially be located where the parking area was at uh, for future use, and the Mercado would actually be located on the what we're going to call the south side of the property. The design of the Mercado is a different uh, from the uh, Pasco Market. And so if we'll go to the next slide, I'll kind of, we have some pictures of the Pasco Market, and then we'll come back. So this is a Pasco Market here that we uh, visited. You can see that it's uh, steel structures uh, with, uh, with tarpene and things like that, kind of uh, uh, temporary in nature. The idea that we had actually, well, we need to make sure that it's temporary in nature. So when the school district was to say we want to develop that property, we would actually have, next slide, please. Uh, something like this. And the reason why we looked at this structure here is, is a couple of reasons. Um, these can actually be theme painted. Uh, they can also provide security. Right now in the marketplace, folks have to load all their goods in uh, in the morning before the market opens. And then when the market closes, they spend hours to unload their goods to secure them so that they turn around and have to do the same thing over and over the next day. One of the things that we took away from the marketplace was actually the ability to secure with this and actually be able to open up these spaces to larger retail spaces. So you can see examples of smaller retail space with the expandability of larger retail space based upon what the individual wishes to, uh, to purchase for that time. And what it is, is this is actually a seasonal market. It would go from uh, April 15th to November 1. It would be Thursdays through Sundays. And um, 
the one of the big things that we had to work on over the time frame here was we had to really take a look at our county code. Right now, uh, or at that time, uh, markets were not allowed in rural village zoning. We had to take a look at, uh, you know, what would be some of the nuances that would allow that not to only occur in that particular location in the county, but uh, where it would be able to occur in other locations of the county for other communities, perhaps uh, put something maybe not necessarily Mercado, but uh, some other type of marketplace or economic uh, driver. And so we were able to uh, work uh, with our community development department through the planning commission, uh, had public hearings and actually have been able to do a text amendment that would actually allow under a conditional use permit, a market to actually exist on the existing property in that rural village zoning. So um, if you'll go back two slides for me, please. So we had a couple of questions we wanted to answer. What was the history of the Mercado? I think I've kind of given you a little bit of that. Um, with our, we've had some staff turnaround. You guys had some staff turnover as well. Uh, but we're back uh, having that conversation. We have uh, have been uh, moving back and forth on a draft lease agreement of what that would look like uh, with uh, uh, with staff. And uh, so that's kind of where we're at now. We haven't reached an agreement to come before either of the boards uh, for consideration, but are still working through some of the details. And um, so, but uh, I'm going to turn it over to Ron to kind of answer the question, why a Mercado in Atchee Valley? So when we were thinking about uh you know, really why, why would we want to do this? There's really a multiple uh, reasons to create a Mercado. Um, one of the first, as you can see there, the Latino population in the Wenatchee MSA is 30%. Um, one of the things that has really uh, stood out to me when we were doing some study actually for the trades district when I was at the port, was that only 10.8% of businesses in the Wenatchee MSA are owned by Hispanic uh, folks. And so there's real disparity in ownership. Um, Latino businesses nationwide have been growing substantially faster than any other ethnic group uh, over the last 10 years. And so we're seeing some real entrepreneur uh, entrepreneurship coming uh, from the Hispanic community. Um, and so we, we wanted to create uh, a marketplace that's, that culturally aligns with 30% of our population. Uh, one of the other reasons is, is just opportunities. And so I looked at it in, in opportunities. One, you've got the incubator space. And so now we're going to be able to bring in and incubate uh, these businesses. It allows entrepreneurs to, to start up and to grow their businesses. Some of these folks that are trying to work out of their garage or their kitchens right now, uh, it give them an opportunity to actually have a, a storefront and to really be able to grow that business. And then they start to hire employees. Um, Kevin had mentioned uh, educational opportunities, and that also goes along with uh, the business support. Uh, we plan to be able to connect these businesses, especially through that growth stage and startup stage with the Small Business Development Center here in Wenatchee. Uh, we'll be connecting them with, with CAFE, um, with SCORE. There'll be mentorship, mentorship programs. Uh, the Northwest Tech Alliance, uh, we're helping them with their technology needs. So we're gonna be able to bring a lot of resources to these businesses to help them to grow. Um, and then also we have the uh, uh, commercial kitchen aspect. And so that really can help with our, we have a, a lot of small value added ag companies and, and small food processors. So if you think like Nima's Salsa, um, you know, she would be able to use that commercial kitchen to prepare her salsas and, and other goods, and then would be able to actually have a space in the Mercado where she could sell her goods. And so really a, a great opportunity there. Um, and then one of the other things to just kind of uh, uh, last is this was the Mercado was actually identified in the Our Valley, Our Future uh, action plan. And it, it was uh, under the shared prosperity. And it has a lot of lead partners and other partners as well. Um, er everything from uh, the Hispanic Business Council to the Economic Development District. Um, the um, the chamber, the port, um, the county, the tech alliance. So you've just got really wide support uh, for this type of a marketplace, and so it could just it can really help to uh, 
to grow and create businesses, create jobs, create opportunity for citizens, our community. And although it will be uh, kind of focused towards uh, the Hispanic community and, and marginalized, traditionally marginalized businesses, um, it, it really is open to anyone who wants to have a storefront. So, you know, any, any person that wants to start up or be located there can. Thanks, Ron. And so our uh, last question is how will it work? So we have been uh, working through uh, a lot of different uh, partnership stakeholder groups, looking at uh, cooperatives, looking at uh, what entities might be uh, right for the ability to, to manage it. Realistically, if in fact the lease agreement is reached with the school district, the county would actually hold that lease. Uh, we would oversee the, um, the um, subcontract basically management of that uh, with a local uh, NPO is what we would be looking for to do the, uh, to do the oversight uh, of that, but we would have ultimate oversight. Um, the development, uh, we actually are estimating the development uh, with the uh, structures as well as all the infrastructure to be, be, be between 3.5 to $5 million investment with the infrastructure pieces or at least the structures being 1 million of that. So really there's a value added to the property for the school district of about three and a half million dollars of infrastructure improvements that would be able to be made. The uh, what we would do uh, as we are working on the lease, if we had a lease signed agreement or signed lease agreement with the school district for this property, is then uh, immediately uh, look at our uh, partnering entities, both on the R Valley R Future as well as some other identified entities. We we did speak with the former superintendent about actually having student representation on the task force. They would actually uh, uh, look at this Mercado and identify the uh, needs that would uh, that they would like to see in the Mercado and uh, some of the amenities they would like to see uh, available at that uh, particular site. And so as we uh, move forward, that would be our, our next order of business is uh, developing that task force, looking at uh, the uh, business model management piece of how we would do that. Uh, what we're looking at is the ability for folks to either lease uh, space for the day, for the weekend, or for the season. And that would be uh, based upon you know, what their need would be, but also the ability, as I earlier mentioned, for the ASB clubs to actually have space that would be offered up at no charge. Uh, for that opportunity, both for the business opportunity as well as uh, for fundraising opportunity to support those uh, clubs within the school district. And so uh, we're happy to answer any questions you may have on this particular piece. I did pass around and uh, just provided the uh, Our Valley, Our Future um, action plan that actually lists us that in there. I also provided to the uh, the chair, chair Ninguez, uh, uh, some additional documents that actually list this. One document was actually utilized by the Washington State Association of Counties which is made up of all 39 counties uh, in the state that actually provide uh, information to the legislature for county uh, legislative uh, pieces. Uh, House Bill 1133, which is actually, this year was House Bill 1267, was to extend the 0 0.09 remittance back to counties for economic development. That's a remittance back on sales tax that the state takes. This uh, was actually part of a four-year effort and uh, the Mercado was actually mentioned as one of the projects that would be funded with those dollars. And so the county currently right now has $1.5 million set aside and uh, uh, we would be able to go up almost up to $3 million of that uh, $5 million investment looking at uh, USDA grants as well as other opportunities to help offset those costs. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you, uh, the board may have uh, regarding this project. I'll go ahead. Um, and I think I'm going to open by saying that, at least for me as a member of the board, uh, we have heard general comments and no details. I mean, what there's more information in, in the last five minutes than I think I've heard at any time. Perfect. Um, and I wrote down a word as I was running through. Well, actually, let's just start with a little thing. You talk about the ASBs, that's the potential school use, the infrastructure. How would that relate to a school? These are things, unanswered questions, as far as I'm concerned, at the board level. And if we are going to be a landlord and tenant, you're going to want to check out the tenant's competencies and resi mm -hmm. residual, because that's my understanding. Um, so actually, I'm going to go with the little questions first. One of the things that's happened after this idea, and you're right, it was an exciting idea that kind of got sidelined. Um, what, how do you see the impact? There's a similar project in Douglas County on more permanent structure. Could you mm -hmm. comment on how the two projects would relate? Com competitors uh, helping each other, 
How do you see that from the, your county's objectives economically? Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to turn that, that question over to the gentleman who wrote the grant funding for that project, but has also been working with us on this project as well. So Ron, I'll let you answer that one. So, so the trades district, um, I Kevin's right. I actually did write all of that grant funding and got the EDA grant for that. But um, it, it is an industrial facility. It is not zoned for any type of retail. You can have small retail. Spaces are considerably larger. There'll be at least 2,000 to 2,500 square feet. Um, there may end up being some spaces that would be as small as 1,350. Um, it is a true incubator space, but like I said, it, again, it is geared towards um, industrial uses, manufacturing type uses, where we really see a, a some some common uh, uses there is, is you'll have people that will be in that incubator facility making their wares, doing their things. We we know that there's uh, some artists that want to go into the trades district. The Mercado is the perfect place for them to be able to sell their goods. And so we think that there's a, a real uh, symbi symbiotic relationship there. And uh, pretty excited about it. To port, we were fully supporting the, the Mercado uh, because we, we felt that it would benefit the uh, tenants that we had at the trades district. Thank you. And actually, th that tells me that they're potentially complementary. And when you add the idea of art artists, when you talk about small scale um, making food and, and products, that can fit either way. You mentioned in the Mercado. Mm -hmm. So the thing, I, the two words I put around in a circle were responsible agency. You've said that the county would be the lessee and you would contract with somebody. And you mentioned a large number of very capable and important agencies within the district. But I, I think uh, the follow-up to this is what I would like to see is much more practical, pragmatic is what's the nature uh, not get the lease and legals ahead of reality. And I realize you've got to get both things sorted out if it's going to work out. But um, I think that um, for the kind of thing that you describe, there's got to be a responsible agency who can coach, build, correct, control um, as people go into these, any incubator. I think, you know, the Port Authority does it to some extent elsewhere, you know, do you have, I, I think saying that somebody will take it over and run it for you is not the same as saying it will be this kind of responsible agency that will do ABC and we can make it work. I'd like to hear more about that. Yeah, and so I'll go ahead and uh, jump into that first part of that question, and then I can turn it over to Ron if he wishes to add anything. So the county is actually the ultimate responsible agency on this, and Ron's uh, division. Basically, he is the economic services director for economic services in an incorporated Schlein County. We work hand in hand with the port district, but this is a county sponsored project. And so there would be county dollars that would be in this. What we're looking at is we're looking at the management, the day-to-day -day management of the uh, Mercado. So once the uh, business model is developed, which is basically going to be the task force in concert with uh, Ron's organization, basically his, uh, his purview. Um, and then that business model is then established. And then what we would do is be looking for the organization that would actually just do the day-to-day -day management. But the oversight is still going to be direct oversight by Chelan County. And so it's not going to be, we're going to turn it over to an agency and just let it, let it go. We'll have uh, check-ins, day-to-day oversight and reporting continuously and uh, follow up with that. Because the success of the Mercado means the success of both the county investment, the investment of uh, time, effort, and uh, resources that the school district has put in as a partner, as well as the other partnerships that are uh, involved in this, which is Hispanic Business Council, you know, the Chambers, you've got the Port as a, as a partner. You can see the list of partners there, uh, basically, to see the success of this project come to fruition. So, anything you wanted to add? I, I was just going to add that... Uh... As far as for the business support, we've already had conversations with the SBDC, um, with the Tech Alliance, with CAFE about providing uh, technical support and business support uh, to the people that are in the leasing the spaces. So 
I'll echo. I appreciate you guys giving us this presentation. This is more information than we've had. Um, and, and I'll just be frank with some of my concerns were when we were sort of presented several years, it sounds like later with an agreement that was largely scrubbed of things that we thought were material terms and whatnot, it, it stopped making a lot of sense. And so part of the question that I kept coming back with was what's the benefit to the district because we can't just let anybody use our, our property without getting a, an appropriate consideration, even though this sounds like a wonderful, great opportunity. So I appreciate hearing, knowing that we have to invest in educational purposes and things like that, hearing some of the educational value that could come out of this. I think that passes the smell test. Um, part of the other concerns I think we had that can be worked out as we, if we move forward with agreements is what did the rent structure or um, look like, and and you've answered a lot of the, and I'm, I'm not looking for necessarily an answer to that today, but you could see some of the concerns we're going through there. No rent, no, um, I know infrastructure was talked about as part of the incentive in the beginning. It doesn't sound like we've fully backed away from that, although there logistically will be challenges planning for future development versus current development when the future is so uncertain, but I'm glad to hear that is still kind of part of the discussion because that's what I thought it was. And then we're seeing that this is all being taken out and things like that. So um, I think that's why it's important to have the parties actually talking about what, what we thought were the, the details, what our, your intentions still are. Mm -hmm. um, so I appreciate hearing um, some of those things. It, it sounds like this is very much designed to be like a PIBIS type relationship with the public initial land ownership with the private sort of foundation running it from day to day. Um, it sounds like it may be a little bit different if you're looking for an existing third party to come in versus the foundation that was kind of built right. there. So that's just, I don't know if there's any distinction or difference there. I'm just trying to figure out what this sort of looks like in comparison. Yeah, and so, uh, and I can answer, uh, let me go ahead and go to the first portion of uh, what you were talking about, which was the infrastructure piece. And what, really, what is the gain for the school district? Why would the school district make an investment, you know, of their property to do this? Right now, the property is sitting, sitting vacant. Uh, I know there's costs associated with maintaining that property on an annual basis. Um, I do appreciate that the school district did not destroy the house on the corner and kind of have left, has left it there for an opportunity. But uh, really, you know, outside, and we've already talked about the educational aspect, but, but let me just kind of go into some of the infrastructure improvements that, uh, that the county would actually be making into this property that uh, do not currently exist. So the installation of a wastewater system that would not only serve the marketplace, but be able to connect because right now there's no uh, public wastewater system there. So basically a septic systems. And so the ability for a septic system to be installed on site to be able to use for the marketplace uh, with the ability to dry line, you know, to a location. And that's really why we worked with the architect that does the work for the school district is the one thing that frustrates me, not only as a citizen, but as an elected official is when you uh, basically pave a street and then tear it back up a month later to put a water line in it. So if we can get out in front of that and actually work with the architectural firms that the school district uses and basically take a look at what that may be planning, a lot of this stuff can be actually stubbed in to location. So I'll utilize the next piece would be the uh, potable water. So Malika Water District serves the uh, property. We would have to have a, a service that would be connected to the property that would be able to not only serve for the Mercado, but also for school. And so identifying what would that look at look like as far as, is it a four inch, six inch, eight inch line that would need to serve the school district and then be able to stub that in. And so that way, when the school is uh, then built then you'd be able to just connect to that line that's already in place there and, uh, you know, go from that meter. And actually the meter, once the school district came in, perhaps the Mercado would probably be dismissed. You'd already have the meter in place. That's one less expense that the school district would have to, you know, pay for. Uh, taking a look at uh, on-site irrigation. So there is actually on-site well for irrigation purposes there. And there is no irrigation system that is there right now. There would be an enhancement uh, with regards to being able to have an on-site irrigation system that would actually be installed on the uh, property for um, the uh, green spaces that uh, we've identified both the buffering space between the property on Saturday Avenue, as well as within the Mercado itself and the green space that would actually be in between the vendor booths. Uh, the other piece is... Um, 
the electrical infrastructure. So the ability to bring actually electrical and it would more than likely require its own transformer for the uh, for the Mercado, which would basically be paid for with the dollars here. That transformers then becomes a school district's transformer at the time it's just signed over. So their electrical infrastructure would actually be right there on site. There would still be a cost savings to the taxpayers down the road because the costs are of course going to increase over time. Um, with regards to uh, ADA, the ability for us, and this, don't know if this would be viable for the school district's use, but for this use is actually having some paved ADA uh, pathways that actually go between the, the space for persons with disabilities be able to utilize that. And so for uh, um, all to be able to access that marketplace. Uh, where the uh, architect uh, for the school district to put the parking, there's actually going to be the ability for uh, infrastructure right there for access, ingress and egress, which actually requires driveway permitting. And that driveway permitting would already be done. And then of course there's stormwater and the stormwater necessity for any uh, stormwater runoff for impervious surfaces and so forth. The stormwater uh, would already be done for that particular site as well. It may have to be upgraded depending on the additional impervious surfaces, but would already be in place. And then uh, there may be a potential, and we're working with the county engineer right now, that there may have to be some frontage improvements done for the Mercado, which actually means sidewalk curb and gutter. That would actually go along the roadway edge because of development. And so these are all elements that are costs. And so going back to uh, our earlier portion of our presentation, we're estimating this is going to be between $3.5 to $5 million, $1 million of uh, of um, improvement as far as infrastructure improvement for the buildings but about $3 million of infrastructure improvement that would actually be left behind for the school district because also as a part of that will be the security re, uh, fencing that would actually uh, span the entire uh, uh, property. And so there's there's fencing, there's electrical, there's potable water, there's wastewater, there's stormwater. So there's a lot of uh, infrastructure improvements that would actually be tenant improvements that would be made that the school district would reap benefit and the taxpayers in the future would benefit from. So we're paying for those amenities today for use for tomorrow. Perfect. I, I'm nodding my head and giggling a little bit because I was part of the project that um, cleared out that space when I worked when I worked for the school district. Um, it was something completely different than it is now. Um, and I recall that house was there was a fire in that house at some point. Um, and they were supposed to tear, uh, demolish the house. So I'm surprised it's still standing. Oh, actually it's a different house. Oh, is it? Yeah. That was the Chilson residence that actually the old Chilson residence that burnt down okay. and they actually did take that and three other structures off of the property that was adjacent. Okay. So it's all part of the thing, but this house is actually uh, have really good bones and is in good shape. Is that the one that has the well in the back? Uh, the, uh, Chilson house had a well, uh, in the back. This house is right on the corner. Okay. And okay. uh, so it did have some uh, some trees around it that okay. I know the district has cut down okay. uh, that were uh, uh, danger, danger. Okay. Trees, so. Okay. And I remember we used to send the the sewing uh, com the sewer companies go out there and pump um, for our tenants. Um, yep. So yeah. And so glad system. you hear all that all this yep. on the list <laughs> Absolutely. to take care of. Um, you know, I think you've covered most of the questions that I had um, before coming into this meeting. Uh, and you cover most of them with your presentation. Um, one of the things that I want to point out was that the, I think what was has made made Met Health Park so successful is that partnership that um, or that the organization that developed from the creation from the development of Met Health Park, mm -hmm. which is Parque Padrinos, which is now a nonprofit. Right. Um, and it, that space, I mean, it's just it's a community center. Yes. There's all sorts of events, educational health. Um, celebrations. And so I think it's going to be extremely important to to find an organization. And obviously that might come out of your task force in regards to being able to get a group from the community or develop a group that's going to really support the effort um, to, to continue that focus of really making it, you know, a true mercado. Um, again, this is probably going to be covered in the task force, but um you know, the cost of it, obviously we want to make it, um, affordable to the renters. Um, and you showed the image of the pods. Or I call them a pod, the pods yeah. <laughs> are those, I mean, is, is that kind of what you guys envision as the, um, for the spaces? The retail the space. Yeah. And, and actually what's really unique about this, we actually have, there's an individual that actually built the house in Leavenworth out of containers. 
and is actually looking to perhaps go into business to provide housing uh, as temporary housing or emergency situations or whatever. And we've already been in conversation with that individual. And if in fact, and of course we have a process that we have to go through no different than school district RFP, but if in fact that individual is, is able to come in and select, be selected, then that would actually provide a, the funding amount for them to be able to continue their business in Chelan County and then start to kick off a whole new enterprise here that would be able to be located here. But these particular pieces that uh, that you're looking at here uh, can be expanded. We can actually have put uh, two back to back, have uh, walls that would actually be able to be removed and, in, and double the size of the retail space. And so when you look at the Pasco marketplace, you have, you know, it's it's basically the, the 10 by 10 awnings, it's it's different colored tarping, it's it's whatever. And it's not necessarily aesthetically pleasing from the outside looking in. What we'd want to have is something that is aesthetically, aesthetically pleasing that would basically be able to be a area that people want to come to. Right now, about 6,000 people a weekend descend upon Pasco to the Mercado. And a lot of families from North Central Washington actually drive the two and a half hours there to do that. And to be able to provide something here where they would not have to drive the two and a half hours, but to be able to draw people from all over North Central Washington to our Mercado here, to have it uh, be aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing. If you could uh, go back to the, I want to do, do want to point out that if you look at our design um, that uh, we worked with your architects on, right there, you, you see the parking area, which is basically to the north, but you see the Mercado and it's actually in a rectangular uh, shape with the green space in the middle. And that really is for family. And we would actually have a um, gazebo in the middle of that, that uh, there could be live music and so forth and be able to provide that. Um, the difference that we're looking at with regards to uh, food service is there are restaurants that are actually work inside the tents, things like that at the Pasco. What we would have is actually a food truck court and the ability to put up a structure that we would be able to tear down later, but put up a structure that would actually have the ability to open up the doors, have seating area inside, or be able to close the doors in inclement weather and still have seating area for folks that want to enjoy that, but also have the ability to have seating throughout the uh, the middle courtyard area there for families to enjoy. And you see the, the blue dot is actually the uh, gazebo uh, stage area that we would have for the uh, entertainment pieces, so. I appreciate that you guys have really done your research, um, especially the, the cultural concept of it. Um, in California, we call it these swap meets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're very popular. And, um, I think there's one it's in Tacoma and a lot of people from this area also drive two and a half hours to go. Um, you know, it's a, it's a family event they drive. And so this, this project is really exciting for me. Um, I think once we get into the details of expenses, um, or, or just the, details that the, say the task force would provide, I think, um, obviously we would have many questions, many questions. Um, but at this time, um, this sounds like a very exciting project and, um, a lot of prospect for the school district. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I know Catherine's online, so we'll give her a chance to ask questions. Great. Thank you. I just have a couple quick ones. Um, Kevin, what's your definition of success, I guess, for the Mercado? Uh, how, how do we know or, or what, what level of income are you looking at or what determines the success? I, tr I appreciate the aesthetic view that you're bringing into that as well with the containers. I think that's, I think, I agree with you, that makes a big, big difference. The food trucks as well. Um, and not to be uh, <laughs> discouraging, but then what happens if it doesn't reach the level that you determine is is successful what happens then well the thing is is this you know that that success is actually going to be determined as we move forward with the task force it's also going to be determined uh, by how many businesses are able to um actually grow out of that uh, particular we have not set a mark of success what we want to do is provide opportunity and uh, if, if in fact we are able to draw six thousand people, six thousand people a weekend, you know, to a place where those people were not coming before, that would be success. If it's two thousand, that's still success. If we open it up and nobody comes, then I would say that we were not successful in our endeavor, and we need to take a look at this. But uh, when you take a look at the opportunity, when you take a look at our uh, population, when you take a look at the the uh, cultures that we have here, and you take a look at the business climate. 
Um, right now, you know, business is hard to do in the state of Washington and the ability for folks to be able to have a, a maker space to be able to not only provide product, but to also, or develop product, but also to be able to sell their product where it is uh, at a reasonable rate where they would be able to prosper from that and then reinvest back in. And so, you know, you kind of catch me a little cold on that question because we really haven't determined what success is. You know, we haven't uh, been able to get that far down the road. We're trying to get everything else into place to to try to get this up. But to be honest with you, I think that we uh, would uh, at the time set goals uh, annual goals to see. And it's not about the revenue that comes in. If the revenue that comes in offsets the maintenance and operations costs, that's a success. You know, because realistically, then we've met what we need to meet. And if we are able to then bank a positive revenue element, and that's basically paying out the management piece and the whole bit, then that allows for opportunity for reinvestment back into the Mercado for additional market space. And so what we were looking at is actually phasing this in. And uh, so it wouldn't be that we would have 200 retail spaces right off the bat. We would phase it in at potentially 40 to 50 retail spaces to start off with and then see how those retail spaces are uh, are utilized. And if, in fact, we are able to um, rent all those spaces out and then have a, a waiting list for more than we would expand. If we're not able to do that, then we work on the marketing piece. So uh, success to me would uh, just off the cuff would be if we are able to see businesses, even if it's uh, five to 10% of the businesses move on to brick and mortar, then that's a success. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Any other questions we can answer? I just, I just want to say thank you. And from, from what I knew before, you've gone from concept to a project. Um, and then from the school district's point of view, you mentioned ASB, that would give us something to actually work with and the task force. So this is a different animal. Um, it's not a dark box. We're wondering what's going on. So I appreciate both of you coming and giving us a briefing. Thank you very much. We appreciate the time to be able to present this to you. I do have one more question. Perfect. Um, seeing as how you're the writer of the code and can do what you want, um, <laughs> I just want to make sure, because you've talked about a lot of really neat uses for this. And so I, I am assuming the county is confident in how it's defining a Mercado and its code as this exception for a CUP, that all of these uses, the food court, the concerts, the things could all be done or this capacity level and things like that. Because what I don't want to see for, for this or for us being the land owner, a code violation or a not getting it through the way we intended it to, or having, you know, the agritainment battles and things like that. So, yeah, we really looked at the code and, and I, I need you to understand that when we develop code, it's not for one specific site. You know, that's, that, that is inappropriate way of developing code. It has to be able to be utilized countywide. And, but what we did in the code is we actually made it, you know, so that it is publicly owned property can be utilized for this purpose. It's not in every zone. There's only select zoning that it can be done in. It has to be publicly owned property in excess of 10 acres. It has to uh, basically be able to meet some other standards. It has setback standards to protect neighboring properties. And so we actually adopted the uh, agricultural setback standard. So setback standard for ag commercial properties is 100 feet. We uh, set that standard also uh, at, for any properties that are used for this. You, you cannot build anything within the 100 feet buffer. So using the same ag standards, even though there may be adjacent properties that, you know, uh, are not ag commercial or ag uh, zoned. And so we really wanted to take in consideration a lot of things, the surrounding neighborhoods, the ability for the space to be large enough to, to do this and to accommodate that without having negative impacts. And we made it as a conditional use permit. And so everything is goes through the hearing uh, examiner. It has uh, public testimony. So folks can testify and there's, there's public hearings that go through this and the ability um, to, to weigh that particular location or any location towards what the use is. And that those could be restricted to hours, days of use, uh, times of the year. And since this is seasonal, it's not a year round piece. That was one of the things that we also wrote into it, that it has to be seasonal. And we actually set in the code the times that it can operate in. So that's already codified. And so uh, there were a lot of uh, considerations that we gave to this, both from the folks that may live in the neighborhoods, as well as the folks that wish to maybe do this on properties. And so we really tried to make sure that that was locked up nice and tight. It did go through the uh, planning commission process. There were several hearings, and I believe it came out of the planning commission on a unanimous vote to, to approve. And that's nine representatives, uh, basically 
constituents and our peers that uh, make up that. So any other questions we can answer for you all tonight? Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate uh, the opportunity to share this and look forward to further conversations. Great. Thank you. Up next, we have a budget presentation. Thanks. I'd like to introduce Sean Fitzgerald, our financial officer, with a, a look at next year's budget plan. All right. Good evening. Thank you, President Iniguez, members of the board, Superintendent Eagle, Dr. Kalahar. It's great to be here tonight to present an update on the district's 2023-24 budget. Uh, our district fund structure, again, governmental accounting finance systems are organized and operated on the fund basis. The dist school districts operate under five funds, our general ASB, debt service, capital projects, and transportation vehicle. Each fund is a fiscal and accounting entity with a self-balancing set of accounts uh, that addresses specific needs and resources of the district. Uh, to begin, I'd like to start off with our 22-23 year-end projections. Uh, for the general fund, you can see the difference between our projected and budgeted amount. In our budget, we had planned for a deficit. However, we are projecting that the district's revenues and expenditures will likely balance. As a result, we anticipate little change in our fund balance and putting us in a, a good position proceeding for the next year. Likewise, with our ASB fund, we expect revenues and expenditures to break even. Although the projected numbers do not match budget estimates, we saw a substantial increase in ASB activity this year, approximately $250,000 compared to last year, which is a great sign that ASB activity is returning to pre-pandemic activity levels. Indeed, the projected year-end activity will be the highest since before the pandemic. Capital Projects Fund. Our budget reflects the financing. Um, on our 22-23 budget, we have the $4 million amounts, both located in our revenues and in our expenditure side of the budget. Uh, this reflected the construction of a new softball field, which has not taken place. Um, however, uh, we did have other activities that we uh, pursued this year, and those have been accounted for uh, in our projects for this year. Although we did take a um, large part of these projects are coming out of our fund balance, we still have a healthy fund balance going into next year. Our debt service fund, our expenditures mirror our bond and principal payments on our one outstanding bond. Our levy collection is reflected in our local tax revenue, which was sufficient to meet our annual payments. And we are projected to go in with a healthy fund balance for the next year. Last but not least is our transportation vehicle fund. Our state depreciation reimbursement and investment earnings were higher than expected, resulting in higher revenues. Our expenditures are projected to come in lower than budgeted due to supply chain issues and not receiving all of our buses this year. Our expectation was that we would receive three buses this year. However, because of the supply issues, we have only received one. The projection assumes we will receive an additional bus before year end. Before I move on to an enrollment, does anyone have any questions about year end projections? <clears throat> Moving on. Our Chelan County birth rate data shows an overall decline between 2015 and 2021, with several short periods of increasing birth rates, including most recently in 2021, which is the most available recent data. We can see the drop in birth rates during the pandemic, with birth rates appearing to stabilize in 2021. There is a general correlation between birth rates and incoming kindergarten classes, which the district takes into consideration when developing enrollment forecasts. In our next slide, we can see the similarities between both the county birth rates and our enrollment, including a decline during the pandemic. In this detailed slide is our four-year projected enrollment based out by grade level, and it also includes separation by basic education, running start, 
dropout transition to kindergarten, which comprises our total K through 12 enrollment. As you can see, our expectation is that enrollment will continue to decline for the foreseeable future. The decline is based on several factors, including birth rates, alternative education choices, and graduating classes larger than incoming kindergarten classes. Expectation is that enrollment will continue to decline about 100 students or 1.4% from the current year, which is consistent with our current year trends. Of course, the district is ultimately funded on actual enrollment, not what is budgeted. We will continue to monitor enrollment during the 23-24 school year and revise our projections as need be. I'd like to also draw your attention to next to the bottom line, TTK, which is our transition to kindergarten. Based on new legislation that was passed this year, our transitional kindergarten or TK program is now being replaced with what is called transition to kindergarten, which is TTK. Based on legislation, um, this is not considered part of basic education funding and as such must be re reported separately from our other kindergarten courses. As such, going forward, we will have to put it on a separate line item to track these courses. Um, it will not, and again, it will not be counted towards BEA funding, but it's similar to like our ALE, it will be funded in its own separate program. Before I move on to staffing, does anyone have any questions on enrollment? This slide shows our staffing history from 2018-19 until our projected 23-24 budgeted amount. For comparative purposes, we started with 2018-19 school year because that is when McClary legislation uh, changed school district funding statewide. Staffing began to increase in 2021 and has continued to increase up until this year. Our 22-23 staffing budget was the largest in the last five years. Although by year end, we did not reach our budget in amount of 942 FTE, our actual staffing of 907 was still our largest since 2018-19. For 23-24, in our next slide, we have our four-year plan. For 23-24 and our 24-25 budget forecasts, the projected budgets reflect the budget reduction plan that was enacted this year. We will continue to use these numbers as target, but not absolute goals as we continue to evaluate our budget. Likewise, our 25, 26, and 26, 27 staffing forecasts are based on the assumption that enrollment and revenue sources will stabilize, which I will go into further detail in when discussing the general fund for 23, 24. Staffing will continue to be allocated based on anticipated enrollment and adjusted as necessary. All positions will continue to be analyzed based on need and funding throughout the 23-24 school year. Before I move on, General Fund, any questions on staffing? I do have kind of a comment question. Uh, on the presentation, you showed budget positions for this year and next year's budget. And I did ask, and you gave me information, the actual positions are slightly lower than the budget. Correct. And I think that's something that we need to continue to keep our eye on. Obviously, we don't want unfilled positions from the point of view of doing all the work. But from the point of view of headcounts, individuals, um, and the size of staffing reductions, it does make a difference. And perhaps some of the improvement in the budget from deficit to being in balance in 2023 is the result of not staffing at 100% of the budget. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So that's something I just want to stress is there and uh, be aware of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Moving on to the general fund. Uh, just some background on the terminology is helpful for defining revenue sources in the general fund. But I will begin with our discussion of a levy and the levy equalization funds. Uh, our current levy expires on December 31st, 2025. Local effort assistance or LEA funds are used to offset higher local levy rates based on enrollment and taxable assessed value, which is evaluated annually by the county assessor's office. School districts opted for these state funds in lieu of pursuing a higher local levy rates from local taxpayers. Wenatchee School District is currently experiencing declining enrollment 
and increase taxable assessed value. Based on this, based on the funding source for LEA, a district will receive less funding if enrollment decreases or your taxable assessed value increases. Our 23-24 budget and forecast assumes LEA funding will continue to decline based on the current district's current trend. Here we have our revenues by source and a breakout for projected for 23-24. So for context, local taxes and local non-tax are our property tax levy and local taxes and our LEA funds are in local non-tax. If we look at the chart on the right, we can see that makes up about 11% of our budget. Again, we also have our state general purpose, which makes up 56% of our budget. That is our apportionment we receive from the state and is largely driven by enrollment. Moving on to expenditures. For 23-24, we have our regular instruction is our basic education, which makes up almost half of our budget or 46%. Federal stimulus makes up 2% of our remaining budget. The majority of these funds will be from the ESSER pandemic funds, which will be expiring this year. I'd like to also draw your attention to other financing uses of $4 million. This consists of a transfer of $4 million from the general fund to the capital projects fund uh, for the construction of a new girls softball field. This was also included in last year's budget and again is being included. Our MSOC disclosure, MSOC stands for materials, supplies, and operating costs. If expenditures are not for staffing, then they fall under this classification. This slide is a required disclosure to show that the district is spending more than what is allotted by the state and is in compliance with state law. Our fund balance projections for the general fund. Our projected beginning fund balance says is where we are pretty much at where we are at the, at the beginning of the year. This will allow us to move forward with two board resolutions this year, one related to the softball field and also the 2.8 million that was set aside to offset budget reductions. We are also required by board policy to set aside 5% of total expenditures as a minimum fund policy. This balance is necessary to ensure that the district sufficient, has sufficient funds to maintain operations without interruption, and that has been budgeted accordingly. Our projected year end uh, has us showing if um, allocating the funds both for the softball field and the offset of budget reductions that would be used and be primarily responsible for using up the majority of our fund balance for the general fund. Here we have our four-year projection. For 23-24, the change in net assets balance is driven by two parts. Declining revenue sources driven by enrollment decline, the state funding through LEA and regionalization, and the loss of federal ESSER dollars will require the need for the district to continue to look at further budget reductions. The second part is the district's commitment to the construction of a new girls softball field, which is reflected under other financing uses. For 24-25, Budget reductions are projected to continue if enrollment decline continues to decrease. Starting in 25, 26, and 26, 27, we begin to see projected increase in revenues. Although revenues may not increase to this extent, our forecast assumes that the district will seek a higher local levy rate for its new EPO levy to offset declining revenue, which would, which would begin on January 1st, 2026. The forecast also assumes that enrollment decline will slow and eventually stabilize. Before I move on to ASB, any questions on the general fund? Sean, I just want to make sure I understand it correctly because I asked about the balance between years of ESSA funding. Mm -hmm. So is it correct to assume that 2.3 million roughly of ESSA funding is carried over into the numbers for the 23-24 budget? Right now, so I don't know it's approximate, yeah. Yes, and one of the things we're doing is when we're looking at our maximizing our funding sources right now. So I will say when we're fine tuning the budget, I will have a final number for you on those SR dollars. Okay, but there are there will be some carryover into twenty three twenty four. Correct, and that's the last year that there will be anything like that. Correct, we will have expiry. Yeah, correct. 
this next year and we'll have an empty line item for our ESSER dollars. Associated student body. Again, our, moving on to our budget and four year summary. Our ASB budget and four year forecast continues to project that ASB activity will continue to increase and return to pre pandemic levels of activity with healthy and stable fund balances. Moving on to our debt service fund. The district currently has one outstanding bond, which expires in December 2033. The budget is based on principal and expenditure payments based on our debt schedule. These payments are paid by our local property tax levies. We work with our finance attorneys to ensure we levy an appropriate amount each year to ensure we collect enough to make our payments. We also work with our attorneys on maintaining a healthy fund balance, which will be used by the district to kick off new bond projects when that time comes. Moving on to capital projects. The purpose of the capital projects fund is to account for financial resources to be used for the acquisition or construction of major capital facilities. It can be used for the acquisition of land or ex existing facilities, construction of buildings, purchase of equipment, making capital improvements. Additionally, the fund can be used for improvements to buildings or ground and is generally financed from the proceeds of sales of bonds, state matching revenues, and special levies. The fund is also used to record the proceeds from the sale of net proceeds from the lease of surplus real property and investment earnings. Currently, the district does not have any revenue sources except for investment earnings and rental lease income. Based on our budget and our four-year forecast, the 23-24 budget reflects the construction of a new softball field and additional funds for large site projects this year. These projects will be funded through the fund balance. Our forecast shows no activity due to the lack of available revenue sources. The district will need to seek alternative sources of funding, such as the capital projects levy, or allocate funds from the general fund balance to continue the maintenance of use of this fund. Lastly, the transportation vehicle fund. This fund is provided for the purchase and major repair of pupil transportation equipment. In other words, our bus school buses. The TVS fund projects for the next four years. Due to supply chain issues, the bus purchases for 23-24 and 24-25 were approved by the board at the last meeting and are reflected in this four-year plan. The budget reflects the district's desire to purchase three buses a year to main, maintain fleet capacity. Last but not least is our budget timeline. We are on track to, be, to meeting the ESD deadline of July 10th. We are fine tuning the budget right now, and some of the numbers we have presented today may look different as we refine the budget, including presenting final and accurate numbers for ESSER and other pandemic related funds. These changes and any ESD comments will be incorporated into the final budget and presented on August 1st with budget adoption on August 22nd. Are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Next up, we have our superintendent final address to the board and a softball field update. All right, thank you very much. Ron, if you can show my slides up here. <clears throat> as I close out my time as your interim superintendent, I wanted to once more bring into focus the district's strategic plan. And our strategic plan involves a promise to students Thank you, sir. And that promise is that our students will emerge ready for their futures, whether that involves uh, college, uh, vocational training, or, or right into a career. This is the punchline of our promise statement to students, that they will emerge ready for their futures. And our strategic plan really is the roadmap to fulfill that promise. When I stepped into this role about a year ago, I was charged with launching this strategic plan. So I had to learn very quickly the items that were in the strategic plan. And I was excited to see that uh, these big six items, which are an important focus of the strategic plan, include several important markers in a student's K-12 journey. 
In addition, they are steeped in evidence-based best practices and research. And so I recognized early on coming in the door, this is not necessarily a flashy strategic plan, but it contains the foundational elements that are important markers on a journey. And these six items are really those things. High quality instruction. Uh, when we talk about instruction in the district, we're really talking about both content, what we teach, and delivery, how we teach it to the students. And in this plan, students participate in grade level or above standards for instruction and assessment to the greatest extent possible. That is the content piece that we ensure high academic rigor by make, making sure all students have access to grade level or above standards. We also know that a large factor in student achievement is the effectiveness of classroom instruction. And so we invest in professional development with our staff. And that is centered on the belief that all of our staff, no matter where they may be in their career, beginners or veterans, we're all working to get better at what we do over time. We want students to belong and feel like they're connected. Uh, we want all students to feel safe, seen, and valued. And when you think about some of the tragic violent events that have occurred in school districts over the last decade, perhaps uh, the best thing we can do to stem those kinds of things is really here in this part of our plan. As school districts, we often take measures to quote unquote harden our facilities uh, in responses to uh, the violence that we've seen across the country in schools. And we've done those things. We have security cameras, we have gates, we have single points of entry into our buildings. But again, uh, perhaps the best thing we can do to ensure our, our buildings are safe is right here. And we've invested in that work in this district. We want students to be reading on grade level. And sometime between kindergarten and second grade, students do make a shift from I'm learning to read to I'm reading to learn. And that shift is an important marker in the K-12 journey. And so we focus on measuring the individual foundational skills that lead to future success in reading. And we try and identify those students who are struggling with those foundational skills early on and intervene appropriately. Uh, with this outcome that we want students to read on grade level, in particular by the end of third grade, there's a lot of research around that, uh, but uh, as they move through the system, continue to read on grade level. Uh, those of you who know my background know that my personal favorite is number four. <laughs> uh, we want students to be ready for algebra. Algebra can be a gatekeeper for students in terms of access to higher level mathematics, but also in terms of success in higher level mathematics. And so our strategic plan focuses on how do you build preparation for the algebra course? And that starts early on with building fact fluency, basic facts. Uh, this is why we focused in our planning some of our professional development this year on strategies to build fluency for students in the early years. We want students to be on track for graduation. And in particular, when we look at that portion of the big six, I'm referring to the freshman class, but uh, you know, we certainly want students to remain on track for graduation as they move through their high school years. The particular focus on the freshman group is really based on the research around the fact that students who are on track at the end of their freshman year are four times more likely to graduate on time. And that is actually in the research, a greater predictor of on-time graduation than things like poverty level, race, ethnicity, a host of other factors you could consider. When we say on track at the end of the freshman year, what we really mean is that a student earns all the credits they attempted during their freshman year. And that is not just uh, what you might consider uh, core academic courses uh, in reading, math, or English language, arts, uh, science, but any credits attempted, including physical education, art, music, and other elective credits. A student who it does not earn any credit they attempt in the freshman year um, increases the likelihood that they will not graduate on time. So we watch our freshman class closely. 
And our high school schedule has opportunities for students who get behind at any time in their career uh, to make up uh, uh, credits that they may be deficient in to, to be on track for graduation. And we want our students to be involved in real world relevant learning, um, which is why we've invested in, engage, in engaging our students in a continuum of learning experiences uh, that provide both awareness and exploration opportunities uh, as we think about um, their readiness for their future. We've invested heavily in the expansion of our career and technical education programming. We have offerings at Wenatchee Valley Technical Skills Center, and we've increased our partnerships with our Transition House program as well over the years to, uh, to bring this piece into focus, and we're continuing to look at that moving forward. All of these big six items are related to the priorities that the district has identified. And, and our, our three major priorities are a thriving environment for students and staff, opportunities for students, and our partnerships with the community. And so I would like to, to speak a little bit about each of those as well. Because when we talk about thriving environments, uh, students are at the heart of our work. We're really talking about creating thriving environments for our students. And that is about every student every day. We want every student every day to receive what they need to thrive, both academically and in the social emotional realm. So we work to engage students in rigorous academics, but we also strive to create healthy spaces for students where they feel safe, seen, valued, and know they belong. And we measure that directly with an annual survey that we provide to students that we use at the cabinet level to set goals around um, this idea of thriving environment. We've also been working to ensure all our students have access to high quality instruction. Instruction is one of our big six focuses. Um, and so we're looking to uh, ensure students have access to high quality instruction, but this also involves identifying and removing barriers that some students may experience in their path towards achieving our future ready outcomes. We know some of our students have some real barriers uh, that they deal with in their lives, whether it's homelessness, uh, poverty, or, or just special learning needs. So we've prioritized uh, looking at how do we remove barriers and ensure students stay on track to meeting those big six outcomes. In addition, we have prioritized uh, at that continuum of real world learning experiences that I talked about earlier. And that is related to the partnerships that we've built within our community. We wanna enhance student well-being and success through our community partnerships. We've done a variety of things to reach out and partner with our community this year because of our strategic plan. We continue to host monthly interagency meetings with local service providers that uh, help us foster connections and align resources to support our students and families. We engaged in local industry tours uh, through our CTE department where our students got to visit local businesses and learn from the the uh, folks who run those local businesses, what it takes to run a business in this area. Uh, and we also hired a director of Hispanic and Latino relations to increase our uh, outreach in the community. We continue working with Columbia Valley Community Health to provide on-site health services to our students and families. And something that I am also very proud of is the open communication our district has developed in collaboration with our neighbors at the Eastmont School District across the river. The bridge is no longer uh, uh, as big as it once was uh, between these communities. And, and it's been great to work closely with Eastmont on a number of items this year. And I feel there's strength in that collaboration heading into the future. So in, in kind of a, a parting shot uh, for me as your interim superintendent, I bring this back into focus because I believe in this plan. This plan does have the key markers identified that are key markers in the research. They're evidence-based practices. And when you look at where this plan is headed, you have uh, 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 embarked in the first year of what will be a five-year strategic plan. And because we've been through a year of this, much of the work is in motion uh, and will expand and, and work on areas of improvement moving forward. 
But I want to say the cabinet leaders that are moving on and Dr. Kalahar coming into this position have really taken ownership and accountability for the aspects of this plan. And I know that they will see to it that these things move forward. Um, we've got alignment going on with our strategic plan, the big six outcomes and the plans that are going on at the building level. Uh, so that alignment will continue moving forward. Uh, and I'm excited for the district to see that moving forward. This this really uh, this work is 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 for students and it and they are at the heart of what we're doing with the plan. I have had priorities in my work this year, and, and this is a blast right out of the contract that the, the district has uh, with me. Uh, these are the priorities listed uh, in, the, in the contract with the Educational Service District for my work this year. And I hope that I've been able to address these priorities. I've kept them close this year uh, and, and tried to successfully address them. And I think that um, you know, moving the strategic plan forward was certainly a part of that priority. And we've had some communication regarding the budget this year as well. So uh, I want to thank the board uh, of directors for your leadership and support in the work that, that we've done as a cabinet team and across the district this year. Uh, I couldn't have done uh, some of the things that I've been charged with without the leadership uh, of the cabinet team and, and certainly the board of directors. So Thank you very much. And last but not least, uh, as I um, am on my way out the door, I want to provide the board with an update on some planning for a future softball facility. You saw the dollars in the budget, and, and a lot of work has gone on behind the scenes on this, especially in the last three months. Um, one of the things we are starting to settle in on is a potential location and site plan for, for this facility. And in, in looking at spots to put a, a new softball facility, I was able to go back uh, and look at things uh, that have been done in the past many years now. This has been in some form on the docket. I was able to find renderings that went back as far as 2014 showing potential bond packages that included a, a softball facility. And here's kind of a summary of where we've been in, in looking at locations. Uh, the district has considered multiple places over the years. Uh, for example, the Red Apple Road property was considered at one time as a potential location for a softball facility. Uh, at that time, uh, uh, when it was uh, originally on the docket for Red Apple Road, it would have required the, the acquisition of a property adjacent to our Red Apple Road property, which is now no longer available, and there, there's housing on, on that, which limits the space that is available. Um, there are some issues with parking potentially there as well, uh, and now with residents on both sides of that property, uh, you know, you, you run the risk of, of putting things that are going to impact a, a, a residential area with lighting, et cetera, for, for a facility. Uh, we've also considered uh, uh, areas on the current WHS campus. Uh, one of the areas we considered there was near the, the track and field. Um, there are some disadvantages to that location. Uh, for example, uh, there, there really is no electrical near there. We would have to bring that in, which adds cost. Uh, it would displace uh, some other um, uses of that uh, area for soccer, football, PE, discus for track, et cetera. Um, and it could also result in potential disruption of our old hydraulic irrigation system on the high school campus, which could entail substantial cost <laughs> uh, to deal with. Um, we've looked at the Okanagan property uh, as, as a site for um, uh, the construction of a facility. And, and that really, the Okanagan property uh, uh, has a few disadvantages. It, it's, it's again, further away from the campus. It's about a mile away, so it requires transport of athletes to that um, area. But it's an undeveloped site, which brings with it additional costs to get something started there uh, to prepare the site. Um, so the Okanagan property really with our, our budget um, became a little bit cost prohibitive. So we are now looking uh, seriously at the Triangle Park area um, as an option 
for a facility. It's in close proximity to WHS. It already has access to water and electrical. Um, it makes use of some existing parking opportunities. Uh, and also uh, we could potentially make use of an existing structure on that, uh, in that park area in terms of a facility. So what you see here is an initial rendering of what a facility on the Triangle Park location might look like. And this is in an upper corner of the park. Uh, this location actually was the site of a field in the past. Uh, in fact, um, the gray building you see in the photo just behind the softball field was at one time the press box, the concession stand, and the restroom area for the field that was located on this property in the in, in that area in the past. So right now, we use that uh, for storage uh, for some uh, M&O items, and, and it gets used once a year when the Kiwanis hosts their pancake breakfast on site. Uh, but we could do some restoration and make use of that structure again if this uh, indeed becomes the location that we settle on. In this rendering, you also see uh, 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 an additional uh, uh, road uh, uh, extending our parking area near um, Rec Park and the Apple Bowl further down that would allow for some parking space near uh, the uh, softball facility. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about that. That is one of the things I think we need to look at moving forward. Um, uh, is where do we place additional parking for this facility and what are the impacts of putting it potentially here versus somewhere else uh, on that location. This uh, gives you a view of what uh, Triangle Park currently looks like and you can see uh, in the uh, upper corner there the, the gray building uh, is a reference point for where the, the new existing field could sit. Um, and if we go with this location, which is really a, the, the site we're looking at strongly at this point, um, there are some space issues that we've got to deal with in the rest of the park. Uh, it's a good site for the field, but it also involves some additional work to ensure that we have soccer fields available and space for middle school football. So this is also a space that gets used a lot by the community. And for that reason, as we've explored this area of an, as an option, Dr. Kalahar and I have spoken not only to our architects and some potential project managers, but also with Mayor Frank Kuntz about uh, this area because of the, the community use. We've spoken with Darcy Christofferson from the Apple Blossom Festival about the impacts uh, uh, of a field on this location to community use for Apple Blossom. Uh, I've reached out to Manny Rivas, uh, who uh, runs the local soccer groups that make a, a large uh, use of this area. Uh, and I, I also spoke with the organizer of Fiestas Mexicanas uh, celebration because they've used this area uh, as well to make sure they understand the, the spot we're looking at and, and implications for their use of the other areas uh, in this uh, park. And Throughout those conversations, uh, it still looks like the park is open for the community use that has been going on there uh, moving forward if we um, locate the softball field in, in, in the corner that, that you saw from the rendering. We've also had conversations with Jim Beeson. He's here tonight at my request. I appreciate you being here, Jim. He's our athletic director and Brian Brocky, our, our maintenance and operations and, uh, and grounds director. Uh, they've both been on site uh, on this location with me uh, and others looking at uh, this spot. Uh, we've spoken with the admin team at Pioneer and some of their PE staff uh, at Pioneer. Uh, Mr. Beeson's also spoken with our head football coach about this location as well. And, and really, throughout all these conversations that we've had, we, we think at this point this site is probably the best option for location. Um, there are some caveats to uh, the way some of this plays out. I mentioned that we need to maintain some space for soccer and middle school football. 
this rendering shows what it might look like to maintain soccer space and space for middle school football, but I think this will need some further exploration a bit. Um, for example, uh, you see the football field is kind of crunched in there between soccer, which, which makes it difficult for joint use, and the middle school program and the soccer programs kind of overlap. Uh, so currently, the middle school football uses an area just to, I'm going to say, to the east, although it looks like south in this picture, it's in reality to the east of that new parking area. And so Mr. Beeson and, and uh, Coach Devereaux have looked at, at that area and, and uh, think that even though it would be a smaller space, we could potentially get a practice area for middle school football in there. Uh, and and for use for the high school teams when they need to do some some uh, work uh, practice work in that area. There are additional costs associated with removing some of the older fields that you see in this picture in the uh, corners near Ernie's Market and down near the Apple Bowl uh, to create soccer field space uh, down below. Uh, and I'm going to kind of go over what the, the cost differences are to make that happen uh, in the next slide here. So the estimate uh, that you're looking at here, which is just over $4 million, would get us the softball facility, uh, but it does not include the renovation of that older building, which um, we think needs to be a consideration because it could provide for concessions, restroom, uh, team rooms, et cetera, uh, for the location of the softball facility. That is not included in this estimate. That renovation is going to add about $900,000 to a million dollars in cost, uh, and I have those numbers on the next slide. But it does get the, the facility uh, itself um, and it includes the uh, uh, regrass in the field uh, on the opposite end so that we can re repurpose that and maintain the soccer field use. And I mentioned if we move potentially the location of what, what we might do for parking, uh, uh, we could maintain also some football field space there as well. Comparatively, um, this uh, projection includes uh, the renovation of the old restroom and concession area. Uh, and I think if the board decided to move in this direction, uh, we would have the four million uh, set aside, uh, and we could potentially look at finance options uh, for the difference in cost. And we have some negotiation and and work we can do with the architects on trimming some of this cost. Uh, Earlier this year, we did look at financing the, the entire project, um, so we could revisit financing maybe a portion to get um, closer to this idea where we had, in addition to the soccer fields in the park, an opportunity to renovate that old building, which again, at this point, it's only used once a year, um, but it would provide us an opportunity for concessions and restrooms. Uh, uh, coach's room and, and, and some team space uh, along with the, the field. We are still in the design phase and can make some adjustments, uh, which will impact some of the cost estimates that we're looking at here. And as, as we move this project forward, really, we're thinking of it kind of uh, as uh, three pieces. There's the design stage, then we need to go out for, for bid process and then on to building. And in order to move the project forward, we need to kind of wrap up the design phase uh, so we can get the permit process started uh, and then go, go out for bid for the work. The permitting process with the city is something we're, we're actually already having discussions with Mayor Koontz about uh, and, and looking for ways to move that forward expeditiously so that uh, once we are ready for permitting, uh, we can... Uh, move through that process quickly and, and move on to the bidding phase. I do feel like we need to have the permitting in place before we go out to bid so that we avoid change orders in the bidding process uh, moving forward. I will, from my seat at NCESD and also as a, as a community member, uh, continue to, to work with Dr. Callahar to, to move this forward as much as possible this summer. 
but it gives you an idea of where we're at in the process, the site we're looking at, uh, and some of the potential costs associated with um, different aspects of this work moving forward. So I would, I'd like to open up to questions the board may have, and I'll do my best to answer those. Um, again, we are still kind of in the design phase, but I will do the best I can to answer questions. So I'll start. Um, based on this design, it sounds like if we pursued the not the no restoration of the building, the, the facility would not have concessions, restrooms, or anything. And that's not going to get us in trouble. I, I think it would be an issue. I, yeah, I do think it would, would be an so. issue. I mean, we can do things like bring in portable restrooms, uh, and there are concessions available across at the uh, Apple Bowl area. It's a distance from the facility. Um, uh, but we also um, would like to have something similar to what the boys have, and they have team room, uh, which we could add to this facility. Um, and and you know, for me, it there are there's some additional costs, and we have to consider that, it's, especially in where we're at with the budget. But um, I would say we need to do this right, right. Uh, because if we don't do it right, you run into issues later on down the road. And so, yes, there could be some additional costs, but doing it right the first time also saves us costs in the long run. So my second question then. Has there been, because it looks like just between that old building and then what is kind of used as practice field and where this potential new parking area could go, there's a lot of sort of wasted space. Have we looked at just full on the cost to demolish that existing building, move the footprint back and potentially open up more space to, if I'm looking at this right, may or may not resolve some of these competing practice field and or parking issues, because it just feels like there's it's shifted so far this way to the current open space, but if what if we took out that building or moved things back? And I think that is one of the key points, um, Director Norton. I, I feel like um, uh, we could look at a couple of things here. Number one, the placement of that parking area. Could it be on the other side uh, if we did something different with the building? Um, there are, it is, an, it is a tired building. It, it definitely is. And so we could work with the architects on what is the cost difference to upgrade this building versus start from scratch. Um, either way, we do have the advantage that electrical, water, et cetera, is already there uh, on site. And, and uh, even if we moved to build a new, uh, a new building for concessions, restroom, et cetera, um, we have that advantage in this location. And, and we were in the in the building about a week ago. You know, we mentioned it's used by the Kiwanis for pancake breakfast. We turned the water on. They got fridges in there, electrical souped up. It's ready to go, which is uh, an advantage of this site. But if we looked at, uh, for example, um, moving uh, things back further, we might also be able to move the parking area to the other side. Um, and allow the, the handicap parking to be closer on the other side. That opens up space for middle school football that would be interfered with in this diagram. So that I think is a discussion point in the design phase that we could continue to look at with the architects. Um, I think this looks like it's uh, much more practical than any of the other alternatives. And I think one of the things, this is a question that I think it does, is it doesn't compress the land use around the high school. And I'm thinking of if there is any kind of remodeling or transition in the high school, I would imagine that that's a considerable benefit by not placing it on the main campus. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and then I guess characterizing the difference between a little over 4 million and 5.3 is uh, the 4 million we have provided for, planned for, we have a concept, and this is dealing with a long-term liability that's been around for a very long time. Um, and uh, I appreciate your comment and the question that uh, we're not, st we would still not necessarily be on equal terms if we didn't have the ancillary facilities to the same standard. Um, and I assume then that they would have additional value. And my only comment on that um, is I think doing it right is good, 
but that would kind of push my thinking a little bit into doing some kind of capital bond and and spreading the cost um and uh and staying within what we provided for and uh looking at doing it over a very short time but um basically out of an annual expense um that would be i think probably what we i would think would make sense administratively financially Catherine, do you have any questions or comments? Sorry, you can, can't see me any longer. We're in a place where the power went out at the start of this meeting. <laughs> so even if I turn my camera on, I'm still, I'm in the dark now. So <laughs> um, I, I love the, I, when we found out that, that the district owned Triangle Park, which was a, a surprise to to us, I think at the time, I thought it was a, a great location. I agree with Martin. It, it, you know, if we intend on a capital bond, new high school, or change in the high school, it's a, it's very tight in that area. I was not excited about the possibility of putting it next to the track. I think that area is already, like you said, Bill used way too much for way too many things, and we would run into issues there. I I agree that the we are not fulfilling our obligation if we don't provide uh the, the the restrooms the rooms for the the team the things that you know that they have spoken about all this time um so i think i think it's a, a, a it's the best looking plan so far thank you um, I am also in agreement with the rest of my colleagues. Um, I don't think I, I, I would, I would not be able to support something that's not to the same level as, um, the, um, you know, the Breck park for a baseball field. Um, and obviously that includes facilities for restrooms, team room concessions. Um, I would be interested in looking to see where we can cut down on cost, um, to try to reduce, um, the overall cost that would include the renovation of that building, um, whether it be, I, I don't know. I mean, I think right now our priority is that softball field and I don't know if it's costly to do it in phases to say, Hey, we couldn't, we could put in the softball field, the concessions, the team room and all that, and then, um, continue to utilize that open space for the soccer fields, um, and the football field. And then as we move along, um, maybe phase two of that project would be to condition the, that, that space for those two areas. I don't know if that's a possibility, if there's even, there's more cost involved, um, regardless of when the soccer fields and the, in the football field, um, get, if this is a location we use, um, safety seems to be a little bit of a, a concern. So can you explain to me a little bit of, uh, you know, we're talking balls rolling around near two really busy streets? Yeah, good question. And that came up in our conversation about this. Um, and architects and, and the, the folks who put together this rendering believe that we can net up there and, and decrease uh, any risk associated with balls. Uh, on the one side where the street is, I don't know that we would have the same risk associated on the other. Thank you. I'm pretty sure those houses across the street would not appreciate a football <laughs> going through the front door. Um, I, I like the I like the site. I like I really do. Um, you know, parking is a little bit of an issue, uh, but I think um, there is some space around there that maybe there's that potential. Um, you know, I like Julie's idea, but if there's cost involved of tearing down that building or moving things, um, you know, I'd rather, if it's significant, I'd rather just keep it where it's at and renovate that, that building. Um, but I like this. Um, I think again, it allows for a continuation of community use, um, as, and it, you know, benefits our, our softball program, um, because this space is used by community a lot, have we talked into maybe like a partnership with the city for a city park? We were actually talking about that before this meeting started, Dr. Kalahar and I. It's it's a good it's a good opportunity to to reach out and talk about some partnerships. Yep. 
I mean, 1.3 million, kind of. <laughs> it's a great opportunity to have those discussions. <laughs> Thank you. I, I appreciate it. I mean, I think it's worth exploring. Any further comments or discussion? Questions? Great. Now we're moving on to our action items. We have three action items on the agenda. First being our Wenatchee Association of Public School Employees Collective Bargaining Agreement. And I will let Bill talk about this. You bet, thank you. So we have concluded our negotiations with the PSC, which represents our para secretary, professional and technical employees. Uh, and the contract was also recently ratified as a tentative agreement with the PSE group. Um, it would replace the current bargaining agreement that expires on August 31st of 2023. And so tonight we are seeking approval of this contract uh, from the board. I'll move to approve the PSE collective bargaining agreement. And I will second that motion. Thank you. We have a motion on the floor to approve the PSE collective bargaining agreement. Do I have any discussion? Okay. Hearing none, all in favor of approving the agreement, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Next up, we have our policies for second read. Okay, thank you. We have four policies up for second read tonight, 5161, which is uh, mutual respect and civility. I mentioned last time we modeled this after a Mercer Island policy, uh, and uh, that that policy has received a lot of attention. In fact, WASDA came up with a, a template uh, uh, associated with respect and civility based on that Mercer Island policy and its success. Uh, in addition, we have... Uh, Policy 1400, which deals with our meeting conduct and our order of business and our meeting schedule. We did some housekeeping there uh, and made changes to reflect our current meeting schedule, including board workshops. And the last two are related um, for second read. We have 5283 and 3225, which both deal with identification badges. Uh, one for employees and one for students. And those policies are suggested by the cabinet because we feel that uh, it enhances security in our buildings. We will be in the process of developing an accompanying procedure for those policies if they uh, move forward for second read. Thank you, Bill. I'll entertain a motion. Um, I will move approval of policies 5161, 1400, 5283, and 3225, as previously discussed in the first reading. Thank Second. You. We have a motion on the floor. Is there any discussion? Okay. Hearing none, all in favor of, of adopting the policies as presented, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. And lastly, we have the sale of surplus property. Okay, thank you again. So board, uh, we have hosted a public hearing earlier uh, regarding the potential sale of the parcel of property located near Mission View. Uh, which we declared surplus uh, on uh, May 9th. Um, and I am recommending that the board take action tonight by providing uh, some authorization for the superintendent to negotiate the purchase uh, and sale agreement with the county for that property, contingent upon our legal counsel approving agreement on the terms. Um, uh, negotiations could involve, as I mentioned in the hearing, uh, um, moving from a statutory warranty deed to a quit claims uh, uh, deed. Um, so there are there is some potential negotiation that needs to take place. Um, and we would involve legal counsel in approving the agreement of those terms. Um, having had a public hearing on this matter, um, I wish to propose the motion to author, and I'm going to read this through, including the terms specifically for legal counsel, to authorize the superintendent to negotiate a purchase and sale agreement of the parcel property near Mission View 
which was declared surplus on May the 9th, 2023, through Resolution 0323 of this Board of Directors, and authorize the superintendent to sign the purchase and sale agreement upon approval of the terms by district's legal counsel. Second. Thank you. We have a motion by Martin, seconded by Julie. Do we have any discussion? Okay. Hearing none, all in favor of authorizing the superintendent for the sale of the property near uh, Mission View that was declared surplus, uh, please say aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Okay, next, we have our superintendent report. Okay, for my last report here, I've got uh, a couple of things I wanted to share. Just a quick reminder for uh, uh, the community that the Wenatchee School District will once again be offering free summer meals for any child ages 18 and younger. That will be Monday through Thursday, uh, June 26th, so it's, it's already started, through July 27th. It includes breakfast, which is served from 7.30 to 8.30 a.m., and also a lunch that is available from 11.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. And those meals will be served at Columbia Elementary uh, on Alaska Street right across from Columbia Valley Community Health. <clears throat> In addition, our nonprofit community partner, Small Miracles, will distribute lunches at several local parks between June 26th and August 3rd uh, from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. And the, the distribution sites in our area for those lunches include Lincoln Park, Medhow Park, Pioneer Park, Washington Park, and also the Office of the Cafe, which is located at 766 South Mission Street. Um, some closing remarks about the budget. Uh, as the district continues to manage a phased approach to budget reductions in the next year and beyond, I know that there are some additional difficult decisions ahead. However, uh, I was encouraged uh, by the balancing of the budget that uh, happened this year. Uh, I think accountability is important with the public funds, and we've shown good stewardship in that this year. Thank you, Sean, for all your work on that. Uh, I am confident that the district is moving towards a sustainable budget in the near future, and that was reflected in this presentation tonight. Um, in order to make this happen, we do need to continue to increase in efficiencies throughout the system. We need to continue to reduce expenses and align our staffing levels to what can be supported by enrollment. But as we do this, I am confident that the district can continue to make progress on the strategic plan. We have a goal of ensuring that our students are ready for their futures. They are at the heart of our work, and I know the district will continue to provide outstanding educational opportunities for the students and families in this community. And so to Dr. Kalahar and his cabinet team, it has been a pleasure working with you all this year. I have great confidence in Dr. Kalahar and the cabinet team, and I am excited for the district under their leadership. The mission of North Central Educational Service District, which I am returning to, uh, is to provide leadership, service, and support for our 29 regional school districts. And as I head back to that seat at the ESD, please know I am here to continue to support in any way that I can. The Wenatchee School District is a special place, uh, and it has been my honor to serve as your interim superintendent this year. And that's my report. <laughs> Next, we have board communication. Yes. Yep. Right. Well, I just want to say to Bill, thank you very much for for the work you've put in this year. I absolutely appreciate it. Like Laura said, you, you were what we needed in this year, and um, I know. I was looking back at your list of priorities of your work, and I think you hit every single one of them and not just hit them, but knock them out of the ballpark. And so I don't think we could have got through this budget situation without you. You've done two years of planning in one. You've you've put our new superintendent um, into a good position going forward. Um, so I have every confidence in him to carry it forward. And I just I can't thank you enough for for your commitment to the district this year and for 
sticking it out when you probably didn't necessarily have to, once you <laughs> saw what you were getting into. So I it's, and it's just been a joy working with you as well. So I, I really, really appreciate all you've done for us. I'll go next one. So we're going in order. Um, uh, you want to go Catherine? Oh, no. I just, I, I, once again, what we talked about at, at the retirement ceremony. Um, I know from from the little elves that work in your office, you're the first one there, you're the last one to leave. You just devoted everything to this year and helping us. And we are so grateful. As Julie said, you are a joy to work with. You are a pleasure to get to know. I'm thankful uh, that your family gave you up for this year. <laughs> Please thank them for us. Um, and uh, and we will miss you, but we'll see, we'll see you around. <laughs> thank you again, Bill. I also want to appreciate us, uh, you know, say my appreciation. I actually had the honor to work with Bill uh, when I worked at the district office um, when he was a principal at Columbia, then at Orchard, this is soon at Orchard, and then here at the district office. And now under this capacity, um, you know, all my experience working with you have been great. Uh, I've always heard about Bill. I never worked directly under you, um, but I've always heard, you know, how Bill was just a symbol of Wenatchee School District and all the great work. And I got to personally experience it working um, next to you under this role. Thank you. Um, and I think each, you know, today's presentations kind of encompass um, the work that you've you've been um, you pushed through this year. You know, the continuation of our st strategic plan. You know, implementing that and carrying it out, visiting our service clubs. Um, the budget, the the you did that so eloquently and transparent. If if you put those two words together, um, you know you you ensured that um, our district and our community that hey we're going through some challenging times, but we're going to be okay. And you know the softball field that's an example of how you get things done. Um, you know we've we've this has been going on in our district for many 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 years, and um, gave it to Bill Eagle, and he'll take care of it. Um, so that that in a nutshell just kind of encompasses, um, you know, the big things you've accomplished and everything behind the scenes from teaching in a classroom at the high school when there's a teacher shortage um, to being out in the buildings and engaging with our children. So thank you. Thank you for stepping into this role. And I look forward to continuing the work. Actually, I have one short one before I get to the big one. Uh, I have had last couple of years, I've not really checked in and seen anything about summer programs. So I went down to the tech center. I wanted to see their program. And it is fun to see a different group of students coming in for the short program, much younger, and often uh, not necessarily the same ones who'll be there year round. And I got by accident landed in the most exciting event of the week, which is when the fire science students in full gear, like Michelin men and with a tank on their back, go through what's called the maze, going through tiny little corners, having to get their body upside down, right side up, round a corner, go through uh, uh, electric cables and everything else. But what was fun was to see the great pride and pleasure that these students took when they succeeded in doing this thing. And it teaches you uh, many, many different ways of having success. So I think uh, that's part of the greatness and diversity of opportunity and people in this district. Bill, uh, I want to thank you for what you've done for the culture. And actually, Corey, you can thank him too. <laughs> um, you give credit around, and you're part of the result of that process. Uh, by chance, over the weekend, I was talking to an immunology researcher and he was talking about how that area of medical science has changed. It's no longer one guru PhD. The, the ideas come as much from the lab tech as from the PhD. And he's describing that nature of interactive grassroots. And that's what you, you give credit to people and you allow people to give you suggestions. And that's, I think, the great strength that you put into and you've given us this culture. And I really hope that we will see this continue and I'm confident we are. And I, I, got, I just do want to quick, quickly link it to the two graduation ceremonies. At Wenatchee High School, I was struck by the emphasis on kindness and everybody is, we're all everybody. You know, and that's how we get this kind of teamwork going. And at Westside, I was struck 
by the ability to adapt when there are multiple pathways and reach success. So that kind of thing, that's what we thank you for. And you've given us a handover. And also, I think that's what the district can be proud of in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we don't want to end on a sad note. So um, next on our agenda is the Oath of Office for Dr. Kalahar. So we'll invite you to come over. Okay. <laughs> Corey, if you could please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Dr. Corey Kalahar, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the state of Washington and will faithfully perform the duties of superintendent of the Wenatchee School District 246. In the county of Chelan, state of Washington, according to the best of my ability. Great. Congratulations. Thank you. At this time, our meeting is adjourned.